now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to the show today. As always, it is such a joy to have you with us as we open the Word of God and seek to understand it and apply it to our day-to-day lives. Today we're going to continue our series on the story of Noah and the flood that he, his family, and numerous animals escaped through building and boarding an ark, an ark that God instructed Noah to make. And last week we began examining the character of Noah. He was a unique man during his time because he kept in the tradition of Adam and Enoch, in that he walked with God. It says in verse 9 and 10, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, it's that word faithfully that I really want to continue to explore during our time together today, because sometimes I think we conflate belief with faith. We think that salvation is all about whether or not we believe the right things, the right set of doctrinal teachings. Now, doctrine is important. Belief is a necessary part of salvation. But faith is a lot more than just belief. Let me give you an illustration of this. Comedian Ken Davis, he tells of the time that he gave a speech in his college class. And the title of his talk was The Law of the Pendulum. And for 20 minutes, he carefully explained the principle that governs a swinging pendulum. And the law of the pendulum is that a pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point from which it was released. Because of friction and gravity, when the pendulum returns, it will always fall short of its original release point. Each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until finally it is at rest. And this point of rest is called the state of equilibrium, where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. And so as part of his presentation, Davis attached a three-foot string to a child's toy top, and he secured it to the top of the blackboard. He then pulled the top to one side and made a mark on the blackboard where he let it go. Each time it swung back, he made a new mark. And it took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and finally come to rest. Now, when he finished the demonstration, the markings on the blackboard proved his thesis. He then asked how many people in the room believed the law of the pendulum was true. And all of the classmates raised their hands, and so did the professor. The teacher then started to walk to the front of the room, thinking the class was over. In reality, it had just begun. Hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room was a large, crude, but functional pendulum. 250 pounds of metal weights tied to four strands of 500-pound test parachute cord. And Davis invited the instructor to climb up on a table and sit in a chair with the back of his head against a cement wall. And then he brought the 250 pounds of metal right up to his nose. Holding the huge pendulum just a fraction of an inch from his face, he once again explained the law of the pendulum. He said, if the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this mass of metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. 
your nose <laughs> will be in no danger. And after that final restatement of this law, Davis looked the professor in the eye and asked, Sir, do you believe this law is true? And there was a long pause, <laughs> and huge beads of sweat formed on the teacher's upper lip. And then weakly, he nodded and whispered, yes. <laughs> and at that point, Davis released the pendulum. And it made a swishing sound as it arced across the room. And at the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily and then started back. And Davis says, I never saw a man move so fast in all my life. The teacher literally dove off the table. And deftly stepping around the still swinging pendulum, Davis then asked the class, Does your professor believe in the law of the pendulum? And the students unanimously answered, No. You see, belief is necessary. It is the starting point. You have to believe in the law of the pendulum first, but faith is when you actually step out in active faith and trust in what you believe in. But that's where many times you and I fall short, which is why God so oftentimes allows trials into our lives, situations of testing, in which our beliefs in God's goodness, His power, and His promises are put to the test. And when you look through the Bible, you'll find that many in Scripture had tests come into their lives in various forms. Abraham, as you well know, was told to leave everything he ever knew. Later, he had to have faith in God that God would fulfill His promise to give him a son through his barren wife, Sarah, even though both of them were way beyond the years of childbearing. And then his faith is tested yet again. When God tells him to offer that son, who does come to him, as a living sacrifice on the altar. Now, we know that God intervenes in that sacrificial process, but still it is a monumental test of his faith. And that's why the Jews looked to Abraham as the supreme example of faith. Not because he believed rightly about God in his mind, but because he demonstrated active faith, active trust in his willingness to do what God had called him to do, no matter what. You see, there's always a step of faith required if we want to see God do the miraculous. And in our passage today, we see just what that step of faith looked like for Noah and how it came through building an ark to preserve a remnant in the midst of the judgment of God. You see, God always leaves a remnant a remnant of people who have chosen to receive his grace and walk with him in faith. And today we get to see the beginning of the unfolding of God's plan to preserve that remnant. It says in verse 11 and following, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. And what this means is that man was no longer walking with God. They were doing whatever they saw fit. It's kind of like in Judges 17.6, where it says, In those days Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. Now, I'm not sure our nation is there quite yet, but let me tell you, I believe we are becoming more and more like that every single day. And if Noah's day was characterized by violence, it seems to me that our world, at least as a whole, definitely fits the bill. I think of how just recently our nation mourned the loss of the people killed and those affected by the killings 
in that shooting in Texas. And these kinds of killings become more and more frequent. We're reminded, I think, of just how violent our world is becoming. You know, there was a group of academics and historians that compiled a startling list of information. They said since 3600 BC, the world has known only 292 years of peace. During this period, there have been 14,351 wars, large and small, in which 3.64 billion people have been killed. The value of the property destroyed is equal to a golden belt around the world 97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. Since 650 BC, they say, there have also been 1,656 arms races, only 16 of which have not ended in war. The remainder ended in the economic collapse of the countries involved. Now, in case we think that we're getting better, it's important to note that the 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of mankind. The violence being led by men like Stalin, Mao, Hitler, Lenin, Chiang Kai-shek, Hideki Tojo, Pol Pot, I mean, these men ruthlessly slaughtered millions of people. Joseph Stalin, 42,672,000 people. Mao Zedong, 37,828,000 people. Adolf Hitler, 20,946,000. Chiang Kai-shek, 10,214,000. Vladimir Lenin, 4 million. Hideki Tojo, almost 4 million. Pol Pot, 2,397,000. You know, I think it's pretty easy to say that in terms of the amount of bloodshed, we are far surpassing what it was like in the days of Noah. And if we wish to escape the judgment of God, we must repent. Because God will not tolerate rebellion forever. Eventually, his judgment always comes. And that's why the best thing that we can pray for regarding our country is for revival to come. And for people to turn to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because it's only in doing that that God's judgment may, for a time, be stayed. And thankfully, we're already seeing some of that happening. And so let us pray that that will continue. Let's do so. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.